Hello, and welcome to another episode of Collider Mailbag. It's, what is it, Saturday? I'm, I'm Dennis Den. I'm joined by Natasha. Yes. <laughs> and John Schnepp. Oh, yeah, it's early Saturday morning. Yep. Ah, what's going on, everybody? Ah, yeah. The sun is shining. It, it's yes. Saturday. Mailbag. If you guys don't know, this is the show where we take your viewer submitted questions. You can email us at uh, collidervideo at gmail.com. And we'll take a bunch and we'll answer your questions. Uh, Natasha, can you start us off with the first I one? I sure will. Kurt Osberger writes, Greetings, Collider crew. Recently on Movie Talk, you were asking, where does Terminator go from here? I like Schnepp's idea of the low-budget horror reboot, but what would you think about Zack Snyder reimagining it? If he could bring a similar dark, violent, mythological feel as he did with 300, I think it could work. Well, I, I like Zack Snyder. I like his movies. Personally, I just don't think it's a good fit for Terminator. I mean, Zack Snyder does a lot of these action films and they're very like glossy and little frantic. I feel like Terminator is is something that has a lot of tension to it, suspense, at least the James Cameron's ones. Right. And I feel like I, I don't know if Zack Snyder would make that work exactly. What do you think? Well, Zack Snyder did a great remake of Dawn of the Dead. Oh, yeah. That was his first feature film. That's actually I, still my favorite of yeah, his. Yes, I love that version. I mean, I also love the George Romero original Dawn of the Dead, um, but this one had a different frantic taste to it. It was definitely a horror film. Uh, Terminator, if you watch James Cameron's original 1984 Terminator, it is a horror movie with science fiction. It's not sci-fi horror, it's horror sci-fi. It's a, it's a subtle difference when you, you know, which one you place first. You just, you know, or you don't care. You're like, hey, whatever you say, it's a mixture of both. But it's definitely a horror film, and it's a science fiction film. I think uh, there's a number of young directors, or younger directors, or directors who just don't have, like, you know, like Zack Snyder is working in the $100 million range right now. And honestly, with Terminator Genesis, Genesis, whatever the hell they called it, um, you know, and Terminator Salvation, the last couple of Terminator films, I don't care that they spent $100 million, the movie sucked. So it's like if they can't actually capture what was great about Terminator and Terminator Judgment Day with these other sequels, I'd say like go go a a, a cheaper route. And when I say cheaper, I just mean restrict the budget to like five million. Get a younger director. Get a brand new cast. Don't get Arnold. Don't get any of the other people who had any ties to the Terminator franchise because it's a time travel science fiction horror film. The the sky's the limit. And I think sometimes when you have a smaller budget, it creates those restrictions and, and makes certain things more creative. You come up with different ways to, uh, you know, make a film. That's the kind of thing that I'd like to see in the next Terminator film. I've already seen five Terminator movies. I don't need to see a sequel to, I don't care what happened to the floaty hologram in the Gen Genesis film. I don't care. I don't want to see a sequel to that version. I don't want to see a, see a sequel to Salvation. I do love the Terminator movies and I love the ideas behind them. I don't need to see Arnold. He's already done a great job in all the other movies. I just want to see something new. So. Yeah, for me, even I didn't like Salvation and and in Genesis was a big disappointment, but I saw a friend, uh, something that w didn't have Arnold in it that was part of the Terminator franchise that I really loved was Sarah Connor Chronicles. And mm. that showed to me that you didn't have to have yeah. Arnold in it. That's and so you can, and, and that still had suspense, <clears throat> tension, and it had the sci-fi elements to it. So I feel like you could do that. If you go that route, though, of a, like, let's say a $5 million or $10 million low budget thing, you definitely, I think it would have to be kind of a remake or reboot of the mm -hmm. first Terminator sure. versus you can't continue no. on the on, on what they're doing right now. Right, or or you go with like yeah, I'm glad you brought up the Sarah Connor Chronicles. I haven't finished all of them, but I watched a bunch of them just recently on a plane, and I was like, wow, these are amazing. Yeah, they're great. They're really good, and I you know for some whatever reason, I just you know how mo like TV shows and movies sometimes they're like you're busy, you're doing stuff, and they just get you that you miss them in your absorption of of media. So. That's a, that was a that's a great point too because it also deals with time travel and it's like it's another kind of pocket weird universe that explores what could happen within the time travel bubble. So you could even still make a brand new reboot, a reboot cool, whatever the hell you want to call it, uh, of the Terminator franchise with brand new actors and actresses, um, but still keep it within some weird time. Like this time bubble exists because this happened or that. If you wanted to complicate it, or you just remake it, so. 
Yeah, because if Zack Snyder did it, then it would be more full-on action movie, right. even more so than, let's say, Terminator 2, which I consider, like, action sci-fi, but there were still moments of tension and, like, uh, the it wasn't, like, action all 100% of the time. Right. Uh, so, but I feel like if Zack Snyder did it, it would be something like that. I want to see someone like Ryan Johnson, who's a great writer-director. I want to see someone like that come on to the Terminator franchise. Someone younger who's brand new but has that kind of sensibility would do a great job. Well, maybe after Star Wars Episode Eight, he'll he'll get the chance. Right. <laughs> All right, what's next? Cassie Drake writes, Greetings from the frozen tundra known as Ottawa, Canada. Thank you for being the best part of my workouts and showers. For some reason, I was, one, I was under the impression that the Fifty Shades movies were coming out every year on Valentine's Day weekend. But it just dawned on me that no, the next one is not coming out this year. It's coming out next year, with the final one a year after that. Now, I'm not a fan, but even so, I always thought that they were a little late on making the films. The hype gimmick novelty of the book have mostly worn off and now that the next one isn't coming out until two years after the first coupled with all the production drama I've heard I think it really doesn't stand a chance what are the chances of them just canceling the series and not going forward with the remaining two films keep up the great work and big bring on the filthy I think it's highly unlikely that they would cancel the movies because one the last one made so much money off of such a small budget and two both of these movies probably aren't going to cost the studio a lot of money so they're willing to take that risk because if they put in whatever how much it costs maybe 20 30 40 million dollars they can get a high high return so i think they're willing to risk it even if and i agree with you the hype has died down i think the novelty the curiosity factor is gone and they definitely shouldn't have waited they should have released one this year but i i think that it's too much of a it's like high reward for very little risk for the studio. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Schnapp? Fifty Shades of Boo. I don't care. <laughs> it's like, and also, I don't even think, how could this even cost $5? Yeah. How can the movie, yeah. it's literally like two people having sex in a room, like, oh, don't, don't whip me again. <laughs> like so, a couple of buckles and shackles. How much is that at a corner store? I went to Home Depot and like bought the entire set for Fifty Shades of Boo. And it, it's just so dumb. They're going to get, they're going to recasting everybody because the first two people were like, oh, we're done. So there's going to be a brand new cast. You might as well call it Atlas Shrug too, because it's the same type of thing where you have, oh, we're doing a sequel. And then even the, the third movie has a brand new cast. So what, does it matter really? I mean, it might even go home video. I don't think it will because it, you're right. It made so much money. They're going to make this with like a, you know, a box of chiclets and like some stubble change that they rolled a bum for. And they'll still make like $300 million. <laughs> It's just, you know, I don't think it's a it's a it's a good question. I think they'll make it because it made so much money, but who cares? I'd like to see John Schnepp's Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, you'll yeah. see. <laughs> it's coming 2022. It'd be like totally different, like uh-huh. not have anything to do with, with what the actual story is. Right. It'll just be you shopping at Home Depot uh, you know and what? that's it. No, you guys just gave me a good idea. It's like Fifty Shades of Grey, but it's be like all different kinds of, yo, don't throw that shade on me, son. <laughs> like people shading each other and like totally ripping on each other. It could be a really weird, like trolls come forth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Natasha, did you see the first one? The no, I did not. Yeah. I'm I'm not a fan of the series at all, so um, I wouldn't be disappointed if they canceled the next two movies. I don't really think that they will. I think that come Valentine's Day next year and the following mm-hmm. year, that all single girls everywhere are just be like, let's just go see the movie together, be together. <laughs> so <laughs> did, did you it, did you have a bunch of friends that's that saw it? I did, but I didn't partake in okay. it. I was strong on my okay. opposition towards Fifty Shades of Grey. Nice. <laughs> but you did go with them to like the Magic Mike XXL. Actually, I didn't go to Magic Mike either. Does that make me like a weird person? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I I feel like the dance scenes you can catch on like every other like I don't know Yahoo News page or whatever. So it's like I feel like I just. Natasha's like, look, I'm saving that for the real deal when I'm in Vegas and there's a dude dancing in front of me. I don't need to see it on the screen, right? That's That's right. That's my Fifty Shades of Grey right here. (laughs) All right, what's next? Kaiju Darth writes, since the NFL is such a short-term win-lose situation with coaches getting one or two seasons to make a winner, is the movie industry the same with directors? Where if they have one or two not-so-great movies that they get looked over for movies that they might be good at because their past movies were not up to par with the industry. Schnepp, what do you think? Uh, definitely. I mean, uh, directors have it a little bit rougher than actors. Like an actor can be in like three or four big box office bombs, but they get that one that made that hundred million. They're back on top. They get they get those next five or six movies all laid out. 
there you know usually you're pl- you're you're playing those odds like hopefully I'm working with really well talented writers and directors and other actors you know especially if you're an actor you're trying out but once you've reached that level people are sending you scripts uh, successful directors they get one shot to like get there you know usually it's an independent film or if they like pop off really big then they get the next bigger or middle budget film if that makes money then they're playing like oh I've got these other three or four movies in production or different forms of production if one of those bombs their level goes way down you're like nah you're out of the club son back to the baby independence it's it's a rough deal because the director gets the most blame the in the movies like you're in charge if it makes a success they're like he he created this masterpiece he forged the team he managed everything if it if it's a failure that he didn't know what he was doing he's an idiot he's a discombobulated loser everybody complained about him so it's like you'll get those horror stories on both sides there's actors who didn't like you but the movie made a lot of money let's just not talk about that or if it's like brought up later after the movie's out and all that it's a rough business, and usually with movies, the director takes the lion's share of the credit, or they take the big, big kick in the butt. Yeah, it sounds a lot like actually football. You have football coaches. The coaches is, are like the directors, and then the players are like the actors. Where mm-hmm. okay, the the if if the team loses, all the blame goes to the coach or mm-hmm. or for a movie or the director. And I feel, but I do think that that directors get a little more leeway than NFL coaches because. Your movie, your movie only comes out once every two, three years or right, whatever, right? right? So you're building to that point where, like NFL coach, you're playing every week. So mm-hmm. if your team keeps losing and losing, and everyone starts harping on you, and you can get fired. But I will say, yeah, sometimes we we talk. You know, I'm one of the people too that like we talk smack about uh, M Night Shyamalan, right? Right. If you actually look at his history at the box office, because that's the thing. Remember, the studios actually don't. I mean, they do care if a movie's good or great, but that's that second to the box office. So mm-hmm. if you look at M Night's like actually past history, he actually only has lost money on one movie, which Lady is in ap- the, the no, Lady after in the Water. Oh, really? There's a few that he got like maybe about broke even. I think the Happening, actually the Happening, I think made a little money. There's there's a lot of movies where he would like get close to breaking even, may, even made a little bit of money. But right. but like you know we always like you know talk smack about his movies, but he to the studio he's only had one failure to them. You right. know, even Last Airbender didn't like it. Didn't lose a ton of money. So I, I feel like if you have those hits like he had, or you're making a little bit of money, you do build up a lot of kind of value to, right. to the studio. And so, like, if you do have one failure, they're not going to be like, "Oh, you're done." Well, also uh, that you brought up M Night, he's someone that you can you can say from the person who brought you. Signs yeah. or Unbreakable or The Sixth, Sixth Sense. Sense. Yeah. You could say that. You don't have to mention like you know Lady in the Water mm-hmm. or like you know happening. the other uh, happening. Mm-hmm. The you know wa- air is happening or like we're, whoo, trees or <laughs> run away from the trees. Like you know what I mean. Like you could mention his big hits and that's implanted in people. Oh yeah, I liked. I re- I remember seeing the you know The Sixth Sense that was freaky with Bruce Willis. I'll go check that out. It's like you know it doesn't work as much now because that's like that's why they pulled his name off of uh, After yeah. Earth. They were like, yo, this is not working son it's like your name is now become synonymous with jokes so he's had to do his work to bring his name back up to that level like i'll t- i'll fund this horror f- horror film and it actually made money yeah the what visit. was it called the visit yeah, yeah it yeah. actually made i haven't seen it yet but from what i've heard it's actually decent yeah and it's actually made a lot it's like a quadruple the money of the budget just off of the first month so it did the job and i think that's kind of the thing is like you know if you if you're a director it's like the nfl thing is a good uh, comparison but I, nfl you're right they get jacked way harsher cuz they're like on a weekly they're yeah. like you're out son it's yeah. the end of the, you know directors are like i'm working on this movie you have 3 years to fail you know yeah. so yeah all right what's next x men super fan emma frost writes if gambit and deadpool are getting their solo movies why not emma frost if she is more popular than the comics than those two if I'm not mistaken, she is not more popular than those two. I, am I wrong? No, she's not more popular. She's more cosplayed. Yeah. You'll see a lot more people dressed up as Emma Frost. By the way, I have no complaints about that. It's a great <laughs> outfit. Um, like, like Dark Phoenix is way more popular. Jean Grey is more popular. Mystique is a harder outfit to pull off. I mean, Emma Frost is like basically lingerie mm. and a weird cape. 
And then you're Emma Frost. You're like, are you like the dirty version of Frozen? <laughs> no, I'm Emma Frost. Oh, okay. It's literally, it's one of like, you know, when when it's Halloween and gals are like, I'm going to get a little slutty. Emma Frost gets popped out. I'm serious. That is like the ultimate, like, I'm in lingerie. It's hotter than a nurse. It's like, that's that outfit that's so simple and easy. But the character herself, very complex. A lot of people love the character. I love the character. I think... The popularity is not really the issue. I think she's part of the Hellfire Club. So when you see this television series that's coming out on Fox in the next, like, whatever, whenever they get new showrunners, because those showrunners busted off. They're like, sorry, we're going to work on 24 without Sutherland, but we're going to still do that. So they bought, they they took off. They need to get showrunners. they got to get their thing back in place. But when Hell, Hellfire Club comes out next year as a new series, Emma Frost is going to be part of it because she is part of the Hellfire Club. So Yeah, and also, like, I, I'm sure she's popular in the comic book world, but Gambit and Deadpool are, are, are much more popular, more oh, yeah. well known amongst the comic book community. Wait, yeah. Maybe even the uh, casual fans mm -hmm. as well. And also another factor is, remember, uh, Jerry Jones played her in, in, in First Class, right. and her performance was not very well received, so there's no, no demand for it. People didn't watch uh, First Class and go, oh, we need to have an Emma Frost spinoff movie. Right. So I, th I think that, you know, I think that has a lot to do. She with was also well. in Wolverine Origins. Remember when Wolverine like frees oh, all the little kids right. and then there was like an 18 year old, you know, that's Emma Frost. She like gets all diamond style for a second. And then the weird CG Professor X yeah. like get into my <laughs> ship, you know, little like, kids, what? little yeah. kids get into what my ship. What is that? You're like looking at this weird, you know, fake Patrick Stewart. Like, why is the CG so bad? This is past 1999. We know how to do this, right? It's like a weird robotic, like get into my ship. You're like this look a video game. It's horrible. Yeah, and even with Gambit, even though I know he's a more popular character, even I was blown away when they're like, oh, it's a $150 million budget or whatever the hell it was. Right. I was like, really? I mean, he's popular, but he's not He's not Wolverine. So I was like, I thought they were going to throw him like an $80, $80 million movie. Exactly, like 150 I was like, yo, that has to be just like the padded budget of all the executive producers. Channing Tatum is getting $40 million of that 150 I mean, it's it's mind-boggling how expensive that is. I was like, it's in New Orleans? What are they? It's like, I keep saying, it's like, go to another dimension? Mm. Are they building like another world or something? It's like, that's a lot of money. It is. Uh, Natasha, are you familiar with uh, these three characters at all? I am not. No, no. No, no you didn't see X-Men or? Origins. I did not see okay. X Men Origins. Well, you're not you're not missing out on X Men Origins. That's the one where they're, they sew Deadpool's mouth closed. Oh yeah, that yeah. Happens. We were talking about that earlier, where it's like one of the you know studio idiots was like, I don't like the way that guy talks. It's like that's part of his character, you moron. <laughs> I don't care. I'm the boss. Sew his mouth shut. I'm tired of him talking. It's like literally that's what happened. Yeah, I don't know what that the thing at the end was. But the one thing too is people actually liked Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool before that happened. Exactly. And that's kind of how they were able to, to he was able to convince them to give him money to make this Deadpool movie that's coming out yeah. pretty soon. All right, what's next? Noah Lawson writes, Hi guys, I love the show. I have a question about the Sonic the Hedgehog movie that's being made by Sony Pictures. It was announced back in June 2014 that the movie will be a live action CGI hybrid. However, later in November, one of the writers of the project, Van Robenshaw, tweeted out a picture of some classic Sonic games that he bought to play so he could get ideas for the movie. He also said that they are aiming for a PG-13 rating, closing it off with saying no news until next year for sure. Since then, we haven't had any news. This makes me wonder if the project might have been canceled. Have you guys heard any news on, on this movie that I'm unaware of? And if you haven't, please share your thoughts on how this movie is being developed. Thanks, guys, and keep being awesome. It's kind of ironic that Sony Pictures has picked up Sonic the Hedgehog to do this movie because back in the day when Sega used to make video game consoles, like they were battling Sony, but now Sega is no longer doing that, and so it, it, it seems it's fine for Sony to pick it up. Um, as far as the movie's concerned, the only thing that I've heard is that someone tweeted mo recently, I think it was January 10th, uh, asking the, that Van guy about the movie. The only thing he said was, no, we're still working on it. So it doesn't sound like it's canceled at all, but I just, I don't know exactly. Are you interested in a Sonic the Hedgehog movie? Was that part of your, like for me, like right. Sonic the Hedgehog, like I was a huge like Sega fanboy or whatever back right. when the Super NES and Sega Genesis days came out. And I was like, oh yeah, Sonic's awesome. Mario sucks. You know, that type <laughs> of stuff. Right. Um, but so for me, I, I have somewhat of an interest to it in it, but how about you? 
Yeah, zero. zero. I was out just at bars doing drugs, hanging out, <laughs> <laughs> like not, not playing, playing Sonic, not yeah. playing video games at oh, all. You, yeah, you were seeing things whiz by and whatever, but in yeah. a different, in a different di- environment. You were in front of a screen. To, I was in mul- in front of multiple screens, yeah. but um, not any involving there were, there's, Sonic there's, there's the Hedgehog. There, there was other mushrooms yeah. involved, but lots not, of lots of uh, you know video game style things happening. But <laughs> yeah, you know Sonic the Hedgehog as a character and his cartoon and things. I think what they're probably trying to do with the movie is they're trying to set it up with whatever the next video game version comes out. So if they have another one, that's I think that's probably a good way for if you're a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, look up where the next video game is going to be released, and then I'm sure they might try to tie it in. I don't, and it's hard to tell too if they're going to even make it a, du- a feature film that yeah. comes out in theaters, or it might be a direct to video, like you can actually buy it on your Xbox, or it comes bundled with the game. That would be that would be my guess. Yeah, it, Sonic is definitely not as popular as he used to be. I mean, right. it used to be Mario and Sonic, and yes. now Mario's still big, but Sonic is kind of. Gone to Look, the I want to see a Mario Brothers movie before I see Sonic. No, the you already saw one. No, Look, no, 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 no. That one doesn't count, man. No, no. Let's not bring that one up. Come on, man. Bob Hoskins. Come on, man. Oh, come on. Dennis Hopper. Why you got to be going there, son? That's not a real movie. <laughs> all right. What's next? Angel Soto writes, hello, everyone. I know how all of you like to keep the location of the studio a secret to the fans, which is understandable. I was wondering if you'd ever consider meeting up with a lucky fan or fans at a theater to watch a future Star Wars film or just a film in general. I think it would be a fun experience to watch a film with the crew. What do you think? Thanks and bring on the filthy. All right. Before I answer the question, I have to like I guess uh, someone had asked a question about like the location of our studio or something like that on last week's uh, mailbag with uh, with you and Christian. And I started getting these tweets, Dennis. Why are you so silly and paranoid about letting people know where the studio is? And I was like, what? What? What's happening? I don't. I don't understand. And then I, I just I I yeah. just looked it up, and it's like, yeah, like it's you don't. I, I don't feel like that's that's anything paranoid. You don't want to tell people where you live or exactly. where you work. And I'm I'm not only concerned about myself, I'm concerned about everyone else at, at the studio. So on, on that side, I just, yeah, I, I just think it's weird that I should be so, we should be so open in public. Hey, this is where I live and this is where I work. And here, why don't I just give you my social security number while I'm at it. <laughs> um, as far as your question, I think that's in the works. I think uh, John has always talked about doing some fan mm-hmm. screenings, not, not necessarily about movies that are coming out like, Deadpool right. or Batman v Superman, but maybe older movies. I know John talked about Slither. I would love to do like a Galaxy Quest yeah. one or, so, or something like that. I think that's something we're planning on doing, but obviously it would be in Los Angeles. Schnepp, would you be up for some something like that? Yeah, totally. We've talked about it a lot of times. Like we've done, we went out to Atlanta and did a cool meet and greet, yeah. and that was a lot of fun. I think, you know, it's really kind of trying to coordinate it really as far as all of our schedules. I know we talked about doing like a little like a little mini tour. I don't know if we're ever going to get to be able to do that before Comic-Con, but it would be great if we could t- like try to rock that in June or something. But uh, yeah, doing like a fan meet and greet or doing a screening, it's a uh, you know it's easier for us. Obviously, we're all here in Los Angeles. You can that's that you can find our studio by going to Los Angeles and walking about yeah. Los Angeles because we're oh, there. Wait, wait, you're you're not going to host the meet and greet at your house? Well, at yeah, your address totally. Where totally, I pick you up in the morning? Yeah, that's no? to, yeah, it's totally happening. The meet and greet will be in this side alley <laughs> right next to Butch. Butch and Cassie's uh, friendly French toast restaurant. Find that. I live right behind there um, in the alley. But uh, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing up meet and greet. We've talked about it a lot. We should really solidify it. It would be It's a great thing to meet all the people who watch our show because all you guys are movie nerds. Uh, you guys and girls are movie nerds. And we like to hear you know what, what you guys are into. So it's always fun. Like even doing mailbag, you're writing in, asking us questions about stuff. It's if we watched a movie together and then we'd have to do an hour long, like Mm -hmm. talk about the movie afterwards, you know, we wouldn't just be like, yeah, let's silently watch this movie together. See ya. You know, (laughs) that would kind of ruin it. You need to talk about it. Talk about it and then talk to talk with people. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, we did it in Atlanta and it was great. It was a packed house. It was really fun. 
Um, and that was was that part of that? It wasn't part of that divergent thing, was it? No, no, yeah, no, it was no, a, no. That was a separate night. Separate. Yeah, night. that was a. We we were definitely not going to see divergent with you guys. Yeah. You know, what movie be, would you want to see? I mentioned Galaxy yeah. Quest. I think John is going for Slither. What would you want to see with the fans? I'm going to say let's go back in time and watch Battle Beyond the Stars. I would make you all watch this crazy <laughs> Star Wars knockoff that Roger Corman was like, I need to get into the space adventures. So you you can find Space Cowboy and all the other corny characters in a Galaxy, uh, you know, uh, Battle Beyond the Stars. But Galaxy Quest would be awesome, too. I mean, Alan Rickman. I mean, so many amazing, awesome stars. And it's a great series as well. It's like series. I say that because it's becoming an Amazon series oh, yeah. now. So um, Galaxy Quest would be great. Natasha, what movie would you want to see with the fans? That you want to I see mean, their reaction to? I mean, just based off of Twitter questions alone, like the fans, you guys all are so into Star Wars. Like, I would love to relive all those Star Wars moments with them. The prequels? What? You want to see all the prequels? No, 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 no. I don't need to see those again. <laughs> so, yeah, that would be totally I like that. Fun. You know, that would be dope yeah. to see, like, the Empire Strikes Back. I would love to with see, yeah, fans. New Hope or yeah. Empire Strikes Back. We could, maybe we could rock, like, a, all three of those. We could set that up. That would be pretty okay. dope. Well, so, why don't you guys uh, in the comment section below post what movies you think would be a great get fan get together with Collider and, and, and the rest of you guys and what movie would be good for us to watch together and then talk about afterwards. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? Daniel Yama writes, Hey, Collider Movie Talk crew. I'm a huge fan and I've been watching you guys since your 24-hour live Philippines show from back during your AMC days. I was wondering, based off of your personal favorite comic book characters, who would be in your starting five? Thanks and keep up the amazing work. I mean, mine are pretty mainstream. I mean, I love all different types of comic book. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not talking about com uh, comic book characters from movies. I'm talking about comic book characters from the actual comics. Right. Uh, Batman would be one of them. Spider-Man, Superman, the Hulk, and then Rorschach, mm. who doesn't really fit into those other five. And my sixth man would be Dr. Manhattan. How about nice. You? So are, these are like my top five for what? For, I think, just personal favorite. Oh, personal comic favorites. Book, comic book characters. Yeah, definitely Batman is up in the top. Um, I loved Fantastic Four when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I loved Spider-Man. Um, witness my shirt. <laughs> What's up? Um, <laughs> then it gets like I would I would love to. I mean I'm so happy to see Miracle Man, which was like a great series in the '80s, and then it got canceled. Is now being continued by Neil Gaiman. He's writing another ten issue arc. So that's a that's a, a character that no one really knows about that I'm excited about because it's like it was a weird amalgam of of what Shazam and Superman and some of these kind of iconic characters, but like twisting it on its head and totally flipping it out and making like a really weird, bizarre series with it. So the Miracle Man would be another one. And Swamp Thing mm -hmm. is like one of my favorites. So Yeah, I mean, I have some other ones that I like, but they just haven't gone on long enough for me to... Something like uh, Saga... Uh, in, sure, you know Saga or Chew or stuff, stuff like that. Anything, Why the Last Man? Anything Ed Brubaker writes, I'm picking up. Like I'm reading Fade Out right now. It's a great kind of like film noir series set like in in the Hollywood biz. It's a, so amazingly well written. Like everything he writes, I, I usually try to pick up. So I follow a lot of writers or I follow artists. So usually it doesn't matter what the the character is. Like I said, like I like Batman, I like Spider Man, but sometimes. I won't read a Spider-Man comic for years or so or as Batman I'll buy like one or two issues that a specific writer or artist team did because that's kind of what makes me get excited about it. it's like oh what this one writer did this and so it's interesting it's like a different kind of story so you know what I like is alternate history type of stuff like mm. uh Superman Red Sun or uh, Old Man Logan just these Dennis, things Dennis I believe the word is Elseworlds <laughs> yes. yeah, the Elseworlds series yeah. And, yeah, yeah I like those types because then it, it takes on you don't have to worry about continuity you don't totally. have to worry about any of that stuff and you just kind of tell this different type of story Batman's a vampire yeah. what <laughs> yeah it's a stake through the heart. You killed Batman. Well, not really. It's an Elseworlds title. Yes. Yeah, you know. Well, I feel like it gives freedom for, totally. the, for the writers to do what they want. It's totally awesome. I, I mean, isn't what uh, Max Landis is doing right now, isn't that an Elseworlds It's type a of totally thing? Elseworlds, yeah. It's like Superman kind of rewritten the way, you know, exactly how Max wanted to tell the story from beginning to end. So it's it's what Grant Morrison did with Superman, uh, uh, All-Star Superman. It's like 12 issues telling the super the Superman story from a different perspective from beginning to end. And what Grant did was he was able to like take all the weird like 50s characters and bizarro things and kind of integrate it into the history of Superman in a really cool way. So 
my God. Mm-hmm. All right, what's next? I think this is the last question. Yes. yes. David Pang writes, Greetings, Collidorians from the land of Singapore. I've mm-hmm. been a fan since the Closet Studio days and have never missed an episode, but you've missed all of my questions thus far. Smiley Beep. face. <laughs> anyway, here's my question. There are many old fantasy movies that became cult classics. Movies like Legend, Ridley Scott, The Black Cauldron, Stardust, The Dark Crystal, Jim Henson, etc. Why weren't these films successful during their cinema runs? What made them cult classics? Will we ever see remakes of such gems? Thank you. Uh, Schnepp, uh, what's your take on this? That's a great question. I mean, you know what? It's, it's funny, too. Like, Stardust, I love that film. Mm-hmm. That's a, a Matthew Vaughn film. It's a really cool film. It's quirky. It's weird. Um, it didn't hit with the audiences, so no one saw it. And so it's considered a box office bomb. And it's one of those films that gets rediscovered just like Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal is another film that just didn't hit um, with with people who are going to see films at the time. It came out in the 80s. It definitely was a, a bizarre hybrid film of like Muppets, but they're more realistic and scarier. And I just don't think people at the time were ready for it. So sometimes films are ahead of their time. Um, sometimes other films like The Black Cauldron are just marketed in a strange way. That was like kind of like Disney trying to make an adult fantasy film, but it was still marketed towards children. So it was like they were, they were like, well, we don't have an adult audience, so you're not going to get an adult audience until you build one. So a lot of these films that were mentioned were box office failures at the time. Also, critics at the time kind of ranked on them. I mean, I like to always read back and be like, Roger Ebert hated Blade Runner, and it's like, you know, years later, he was like, well, you know, maybe he like in, you know, looking at it later, I've, you know, he didn't straight up change his mind. But, you you know, you read critics and at the time they have their opinion. You don't have to agree with it. But like that had quite a sway, especially in the 80s and 90s, like certain critics opinions. Now it's like everyone's a critic. You can like read a bunch of different critical responses on all kinds of films way before they come out. So it's a really great time to be into this kind of stuff. You, all of us have our own opinions on stuff. So it's like when a film bombs now, you'll hear a lot of people saying why they did or didn't like it. Um, will these films ever get you know remade or remakes? I think of all of them, uh, The Black Cauldron is the one that like, sticks out to me that it could be uh, uh, done as a, a live action as opposed to an animated film. Or if they were going to animate it, they could do a 3D animated film and make it a musical. Just kidding. So what do you think? <laughs> well, Black Cauldron uh, is from a, a book series of five different ones. And that was actually, I had read that before the kind of the scene Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Nice. And it was kind of like a more kidder, kiddish version mm-hmm. of that. Um, uh, I think they could remake that, especially given today's climate. I think a lot of it has to do with, we're talking about trends and climates back in the 80s. I don't think fantasy films were as popular as no. now. You know, you have... Stuff like uh, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. It's it's more accepted now. I mean, we were even talking about, I forgot, I think we were talking about on Movie Talk about the Shanhara Chronicles or right. whatever, young adult fantasy, that sure. type of stuff. And so I think it's more accepted in the culture now. But back then, it was kind of like, oh, what the hell is this weird thing? And, right, you know? Sword and Sandals. Like, there were weirdo hits like Beastmaster. Remember that? Yeah. Like, it was like, I think they that was like a low-budget film, but I remember seeing that in the theater. Like, Beastmaster, he controls the beasts, mm-hmm. you know? But it's like literally like... Or the sword and the sorcerer, where you like have dudes fighting a weird demon. To, I've got to save the princess. You know, there's some weird castle. I mean, it's literally those were those kinds of films that were shot really low budget, but they were a lot of fun. But yeah, and yeah. I love Dark Crystal, and I, I I do think it was too dark. Even I saw it when I was a kid, mm. and I was like, this is a little dark for it's for scary. for ki- yeah. yes. I was haunted by that movie, but I still loved it. Like mm. I still always went back. I was like, I kind of want to watch it again. So. The Skeksis, the Skeksis, yeah. Yeah. really oh, scary. Frightening, yeah, the way scary. they talked, and then like. Oh, yeah. those little humming guys. Oh, um, what were their names? Not the Skeksis, right. the opposite of them. Yeah, yeah. The and humming then, guys. And then they merge together That's to right. form whatever the hell. at the, at the Super very crystal turtle thing. Whatever yeah. it's <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's just all timing. Yeah. You know, and also publicity. You know, like I... When you're talking about movies, like, so The Matrix hit it pretty big, but remember, there's a movie kind of similar, not like exactly similar, but uh, Alex Proyas' Dark City kind of right. had that vibe. Totally. But no one really saw that. I saw that in the theater, but it, yeah. it didn't do very well. But now it's a cult classic. Yeah. That's like a film where you're like, you haven't seen Dark City? You got to see the extended cut, yo. Mm-hmm. That's ma- it's an amazing film. Yeah. So. It really is almost like a superhero film when you really think about it. It's like Twilight Zone meets a superhero film because they're building that dude and he's like, he is the one. He's like yeah. got those psionic powers and they're flying around the city at the end. You're like, wait a minute, they're like superheroes. And then, then the Twilight Zone ending. If you haven't seen Dark City, get on that. 
Yeah. That's awesome. All right, guys. Uh, that's it for this episode of Collider Mailbag. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we'll have a, another episode tomorrow, also with the same lovely crew that we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And Schnepp? Yo, you can follow me on just uh, Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And check out my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to tdoslwh.com. Get yourself all the extra eight hours of sweaty goodness or watch it on Showtime. See you later. And you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZENG. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel, YouTube.com slash Collider Videos. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.